Nehemiah chapter four. I just started reading chapter three, but then I realized that I read chapter three already. So Nehemiah chapter four, I'm reading out the application study Bible, um, and I'm reading the NLT version of the Bible. Whatever version of the Bible that you have is perfectly fantastic by me. I think that whatever version of the Bible you are encouraged to read is the best version of the Bible, whatever one you read. I know there's a lot of very strong proponents of reading King James Version only, and I do support them. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're coming from, but I think that if it's too difficult for you to understand the King James Version of the Bible, it might not be the best place to start. And because the King James Version might require you to read it more times, there's definitely a benefit to that. But there are so many versions of the Bible, and I just think being in the Word of God is incredibly beneficial. It's also helpful to read more than one version, to read commentaries, to read study Bibles, to listen to sermons, talk about specific passages. Being in the Word of God, it's a blessing. This is God's divine Word to us. If you don't know how to hear from God, there's no more clear way than to pick up the Word that is written on these pages of this book. So, Nehemiah chapter 4. Enemies oppose the rebuilding. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think that they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap? and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. <clears throat> then I prayed, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on its own head, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashadites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guard the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the walls by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. Look at the opposition they're facing. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall and in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then, as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked, while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah, who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted by their side. The trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and the officials and all the people, the work is very spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That 
way they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me, ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Wow, that is a lot of opposition, isn't it? But Nehemiah was living in the Persian king's court. He was the king's cupbearer in Persia. He had a really nice situation going for him. He was the king's right-hand man, drinking the king's wine before him to make sure that it was good enough for the king. And he's left that place. He could have stayed in Persia, living his cushy life and doing whatever he wanted to do, ignoring the situation. But God put it on his heart that he needed to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild a wall to keep Jerusalem safe. Nehemiah had never even lived in Jerusalem. He's been in Persia after the captivity this whole time. And now he's left his situation to go home and rebuild a wall despite all this opposition that he's facing. And he remains faithful to what God called him to do. Chapter five, Nehemiah defends the oppressed. About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families. We need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, vineyards, and homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we've had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters and we are helpless to do anything about it. For our fields and vineyards are already mortgaged to others. When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. At the meeting, I said to them, we are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners, but you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What are you doing is not, what you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain. But now let us stop this busyness of charging interest. You must restore their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes to them this very day and repay the interest you charged when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised. I shook out the folds of my robe and said, If you fail to keep your promise, may God shake you like this from your homes and from your property. The whole assembly responded, Amen. And they praised the Lord and the people did as they had promised. For the entire 12 years that I was governor of Judah, from the 20th year to the 20 to the 32nd year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. Neither I nor my officials drew on our official food allowance. The former governors, in contrast, had laid heavy burdens on the people, demanding a daily ration of food and wine besides 40 pieces of silver. Even their assistants took advantage of the people, but because I feared God, I did not act that way. I also devoted myself to working on the wall and refused to acquire any land. And I required all my servants to spend time working on the wall. I asked for nothing, even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table beside all the visitors from other lands. The provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, we need a large supply of all kinds of wine. Yet I refuse to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden. Remember, oh my God, all that I have done for these people and bless me for it. Ugh, I'm such a sap. I don't want to start crying. It is beautiful. 
Okay, do we have time for chapter six? I just wanted to say, when I was younger, and this is not about me at all, um, but I do have an example in my family where um, my dad was an army officer and he would often get assignments that were pretty good assignments. And I do feel like my dad worked a lot and it was very difficult as a daddy's girl, to be honest. Um, he was gone all the time. He was always working. He was not home very often. Um, but he was still a very good role model when he was around. And very often he would get fantastic assignments like Hawaii or whatever. And my dad, as a leader and as a, my grandmother, my great grandmother both loved the Lord. And again, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with them. Um, but my dad would give good assignments to others. And he also took a cut in his pay. I know of at least once, if not more than once, because that's what you're supposed to do. And I know that this day and age, it's not the way we're raised. That's not the way that we're taught. That's not the way society teaches us. It's all about what we can get for us. But that's not how we are as a family of God. We are to look out for one another, to not esteem ourselves as better than someone else because of our job or our title. We're all one body in Christ. And just because you have a lofty position doesn't mean we should treat others as inferior. We have to look at the big task at hand and normalize doing the right thing and normalize standing up for the word of God and doing things the way that God tells us to do them and seeing what is prized in God's eyes. Um, okay, so let's see if we can get through chapter six. Continued opposition to rebuilding. Sanballat, Tobiah, Jeshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained. Though we had not yet set up the doors and the gates. So Sanballat and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sinbad's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There's a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it's true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you're building the wall. According to the reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You're making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Amen. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and grandson of Mehetabal, who was confined to his home. He said, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Oh my goodness. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they would be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sanballat have done. And remember Noadiah, the prophet, and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished. He finished the wall in 52 days. Oh, it says it. Just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies in the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. Amen. During those 52 days, many letters went back and forth between Tobiah and the nobles of Judah. For many in Judah had sworn allegiance to him because his father-in-law was Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehoahan was married to the daughter of Meshulam, Mesh, oh my goodness, Meshulam, son of Berechiah. They kept telling me about Tobiah's good deeds. 
And then they told him everything I said. And Tobiah kept sending threatening letters to intimidate me. Even when you face persecution, if God has asked you to do something, stick with what God has put on your heart. Just because people come to mock you and make you feel belittled, um, continue to just trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your understanding. And just because someone says they heard something from God about you, it doesn't mean that they did. God will often speak to you what he wants to say to you. And he will use other people sometimes, but guard your heart and your mind when you hear things like that. Um, it says that in the very Bible. That's not coming from me. That is wisdom from God. If someone says that they're hearing something from God to you, guard your heart, pray to God, ask him for his direction in your life. And thank you so much for joining me. I hope to see you again very soon as we press through the book of Nehemiah. Have a blessed and beautiful day. Bye-bye.